Hi everyone, this is Matt and Jesse looking at chapter 3 of the Dynamic Caro Khan course for chess goals. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to be looking at the Panov attack. Yep, so another common line you're going to see in a lot of your games, uh, each of these chapters is going to be roughly 10% of your games. So the main um, move order here, of course, e4, c6, starting with our Caro. Um, d4, we strike back with d5, and they capture. We capture back, and they play c4. Is this kind of the start of where the Panov normally begins? And the thing that we have to our advantage in this position is we can focus on this d4 pawn. So if the d5 and c4 pawns trade off, the pawn on d4 becomes an isolated pawn. And if the pawn on c4 for white has to push forward in the future, then the pawn on d4 becomes a backward pawn. So that's something to keep in mind going forward. Positionally, we have a nice uh, weak pawn on d4 that we can attack later on. But then the plus for white is white has a lot of space here. So they're immediately grabbing this extra space in the center. And the Panov is known to be a very sharp opening sometimes. Um, so what we're looking to do in this chapter is uh, play a solid system that doesn't allow our king to get attacked real quickly. But also we want a dynamic system similar to our other chapters where we're able to put the pressure on white or at least have like a coherent, consistent plan that we can develop pieces in a certain way to attack white's weaknesses. So the move order that I recommend in this chapter is knight f6. Um, this is the most popular move. And most players will play knight c3, but we will look at a knight f3 line uh, towards the end of this chapter. And now here, um, in my chess career, I've played quite a bit of g6 on this move instead of knight to c6. And I almost uh, wrote a whole chapter on g6 for this course, and I just wasn't quite happy with the lines. I think with best play, it's a bit complicated because white can end up taking on d5 and they can hold that pawn quite a while. Um, this is something that Jesse and I have looked at uh, in person going over some Carol lines. And haven't you had some similar thoughts on this line, Jesse, when they grab that pawn on d5? Yeah, so I kind of got into trouble in one of my standard games, actually, where um, they captured this d5 pawn at an inopportune time for me, opportune time for them. And they really just kind of held on to the pawn. Luckily for me, they didn't play in the most, uh, like, in the best way to really hang on to the pawn. But... If you play this early g6 stuff, it does allow them to capture the pawn and hang on to it in some lines. So, um, and I I also found those positions really hard to like force anything. It was just like such a balanced equal position that there really wasn't anything to really do other than hope your opponent drops a pawn or something. So, I like getting to the knight out to a nice aggressive square with the g6 lines. A lot of the time you're going to bring your knight to the more passive d7 square and then maybe kick it to b6 in some lines. So instead we're playing um, knight of, or sorry, knight c6. And then this is really like the first big deviation, I guess, from standard main line is this move. So if we go back a move, the main move here, if you want to call it that, is knight e6. Knight c6 is played about a little over half as often as e6. Okay, and I'm looking at the uh, club players, and knight c6 is the most popular move, so I think that shows a little bit of a difference of what you see at the grandmaster level versus the club level. Um, so we're going with a line that's going to be a bit rare on the next move, and this is what I, I'm pretty excited about. So let's go with the, the most popular move for white here, knight f3. And this is after a lot of research. I found this move a6. Um, I'm not sure why it's not more popular because uh, it doesn't score that poorly. It actually scores pretty well. And uh, the engine likes it just as well as the other moves, it seems. What I really like about a6 is not only is it a rare move, but it puts the question to white. What do you want to do with this c4 pawn? And this is what we're going to focus on in this opening. Once we figure out what happens with the c4 pawn, then we figure out how we attack the d4 pawn. Um, the other nice thing about a6 is it guards the b5 square. So oftentimes in the Panov, you'll see their bishop come to b5 or their queen come to a4 with check. Uh, now we have the a6 pawn guarding b5, and we also have the potential to play pawn to b5 in some lines if the white queen comes out to a4. So this is a very useful move. It's a bit of a waiting move here. We're trying to see how white sets up. But it also keeps white from getting a really strong attack on the queen side. 
um, and it, it eliminates a lot of the really forced lines that you see in some other pan out variations. So I'm really excited to, to show this move A6. Yeah, this is this A6, if we go back another move, so in, I'm looking at the Masters database and there's about 2,000 or so games here. And A6 is played in 20 of them. So we're very much in like, not unchartered territory, but territory that hasn't been too chartered. I don't, I don't know the- uh... Close to it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah close <laughs> pretty to close it. to it. And so I feel like the game is again in our court, which is kind of a theme of this repertoire is we want to make sure we're more in book than our opponent. And here we're going to go over four different alternatives for what you're going to see in most of your games. So do you want to start with C takes first? Yeah, so I'll show the four uh, just real quick with arrows. We're going to look at C takes D5, Bishop to G5, Pawn to C5, and Bishop to E2. So those are the four moves we're going to look at. Uh, we'll start with the most common and the most straightforward C takes D5. Uh, so in this position, that's probably the strongest move. In this position, we really only have one move to play. Knight takes D5. And now that we've figured out what white's doing with this pawn on c4, we realize that we have an isolated queen pawn position with this pawn on d4. And we're going to go for g6, bishop g7, and use the g7 bishop to help pressure this pawn on d4. And we also have the light square bishop ready to come out later. Either it can go to f5, g4, or even e6. Yep, and a lot of time in these isolated queen pawn um, types of games. So there's there's a lot of uh, written about um, isolated queen pawns, but in general, this knight right here is very happy if if it can blockade the pawn and uh, not allow white to kind of push down and really use that isolated pawn to either sack it off or get us into a weird position where it opens up lines and gets an attack. So we'll go over that a bit more, and especially at the end of like in our plans at the end of each line. Um, so white starts here, bishop c4 attacking our knight, and we need to add a defender to that knight. So we're going to play the natural um, bishop e6, defending the knight and uh, developing a piece. Um, but this is also, yep, allowing this tactic here. Um, but it's also a bit of a... Um, unnatural like it's both natural and unnatural because it's not a super common square to bring your bishop yeah and this is a move that i'm recommending quite a bit in this chapter uh, what i like about it is we're taking this position that has the iqp and we're adding some tactics we're adding some chances for white to make mistakes so right here with bishop e6 we're already threatening knight takes c3 and if white decides oh let's just simplify on d5 all of these trades will help us against the isolated queen pawn because then we can just bring our rook behind to d8. Our bishop is still coming out to g7 hitting d4. Um, and really that makes our life easy if these pieces start to trade off. So bishop e6 is also setting up some trade offers for white. Uh, so in this position, there's really two moves that I looked at, bishop to b3. And we'll see a large blunder here that's very common, uh, queen to b3. So what do you want to start with, Jesse? Bishop b3? Um, let's start with bishop b3. So I think this is the strongest move. It puts the bishop back onto a safe square. Um, okay, so the de bishop is defended by both the queen and the pawn on this square. Yeah, so if we take on c3, we're not winning any material. And here the move I'm recommending is knight to a5. And what I like about this move is, again, we're playing very aggressive. Right, we're, we're uh, attacking white's position, making white think about tough choices. So does white want to give us this bishop pair with knight takes b3? And also we're kind of utilizing this a6 pawn guarding b5. So if there's bishop a4 check, uh, we can probably play pawn to b5 and very easily stop it. So very quickly in the opening, we're already putting some pressure on white's position. This is the most popular move, bishop to c2. And now, how do you think we should get this bishop out, Jesse, from f8? Well, we're not going to be pushing this e-pawn anytime soon because we need the bishop here to defend the knight. So we're going to want to, I assume, fianchetto, so g6, bring the bishop to g7, and add more pressure to the backwards, or I guess not backwards pawn, but isolated d-pawn. Yep, that's exactly right. So we'll start with g6. Um, one thing to note here, if white plays knight to g5, uh, attacking this bishop on e6, Oops, sorry, I took your arrow off. <laughs> what we can do is take on c3, hitting the white queen. 
and then we can relocate our bishop to either d5 or c4. So that's a nice little tactic to keep in mind. Knight g5 is not a very good move because we have knight takes c3. So here we'll go with the natural castle, bishop g7. And now here we'll demonstrate this knight to g5 hop because I think you'll find a lot of players are going to play knight to g5. As uncomfortable as this is for us to play or unusual, it also looks unusual to the opponent and they're going to try to take advantage of it. And knight g5 is the, the obvious move to try to take advantage of bishop e6. So after this, we can do the maneuver knight takes c3. Um, what do you think of knight takes e6 as a move here, Jesse? Just yeah, like... so that was what I was evaluating in my head. So knight takes, so we're at equal material. We take here, they take here. Um, so here we're equal material. Both knights are under attack. Yep, and the um, d-pawn is hanging with our bishop attacking it. So okay, that can help so... guide you on the next move. Okay, so maybe we want to do like a desperado and take this pawn? I think it's uh, Rick takes d8, actually. So... Okay, so just capture the... Okay, so we can just capture the knight and we'll just win the d pawn at the end. Right, yep. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't really make sense for white to play knight takes e6 once you calculate the variations. So the only move is uh, b takes c3. Now we put the bishop on d5 and... Our bishop is a really strong piece. It's hitting these both diagonals. Um, this pawn structure for white, these are called hanging pawns. So that's when there's two pawns side by side and there's no pawns on either side of those two. And the best way to attack hanging pawns is actually to get one to push forward. So when they're next to each other, they're at their strongest. When one pushes forward, then what you can do is blockade them. Mm -hmm. So we're already setting up a really nice blockade here. Um, and I think we have a nice position and then the plan going forward is going to be castle, put a rook on c8, kick this knight out with h6, um, and then we can use these center pawns as targets playing against them on the light squares. Uh, I have one move I see here for white is what happens if they go uh, bishop e4 to trade off the light square bishops? Do we just take and plop a knight in? Because that's a pretty juicy square on c4. Yeah, I think we could take, or we could also let white take us. So similar to when there's an isolated queen pawn, when there's hanging pawns, the trades usually help the side that is attacking the hanging pawns because it helps us put the, the rooks and the queen in front of the pawns, um, and they just become a little harder to defend. Yeah. yeah, in general, the isolated queen's pawn is going to be dynamic in the middle game, but pretty weak in an end game. So trade should always favor us. So that's a good... Uh, little uh, tip in the isolated queen pawns to keep in the back of your mind as you navigate middle games. Yeah, and, and almost all the rules for isolated queen pawn are true for hanging pawns as well. Like, they really okay. go hand in hand. Okay, so now let's back up and look at the white blunder on move 9. So instead of retreating the bishop, queen b3. Yes. So reinforcing, uh, reinforcing the knight, but I see that this runs into the same move. Right, so the maneuver, yeah, the maneuver is knight a5. Okay, so what if white plays queen a4 here? Queen a4 check. Queen a4 check. Um, well, so now we can play this b4 move, and our queen is defending the knight. Right, b5. Taking, or b5. Taking Sorry. advantage of our a6 from earlier on. So we're finding mm -hmm. ways to use this rare move a6 in the opening. Um, so he, here I played out a few moves. Let's say white takes. They'll get two pieces for the pawn. And here we do have to be a little bit careful, because even though we played a6 to stop these diagonal attackers, white now <laughs> has both are. of them available, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the line I looked at here is what I think is the trickiest line for white. So even though we're already up a piece for two pawns, we still have to get our king to safety. Uh, and white can play this move knight to e5. Here we have to be extremely careful. If we go bishop takes bishop and the queen takes back, we're actually getting checkmated. Yeah, that's check. <laughs> that's check, and we can only block. <laughs> right, and then next move is checkmate, uh, and there's no like knight c6 here. Or I'm sorry, knight c6 is the move. Knight c6 is what we want to play. So we have the rook hitting the queen. That's the important point. So we need to figure out that we can move the knight back. Rook hits the queen, uh, and now we're in a completely winning position because we're just going to be able to start trading off, and we're already up the piece. Yeah, so 
uh, one sharp uh, variation to learn, but if you put this one away in memory, you're going to win the game most of the time. So I just flipped on the engine. It says winning for black, negative 3.7. I'll take a 3.7. <laughs> yeah, so, I'll take it. So I looked at a couple more moves here. Knight takes c6, because you might think, okay, well, what if they take here hitting the queen? Uh, we can go rook takes their queen. Knight takes d8. Bishop takes b5. I looked at knight b7 and e6. So now if we do a material count, we are still up the piece for two pawns. So a and b for a piece. We have two other pieces remaining, two rooks each. Um, and there is still and we this have an extra pawn. Yeah, and the, and the pawn on d4 is weak. So mm -hmm. we're in really good shape here. Probably still close to that 3.7, maybe even higher. <laughs> I, see ne I see negative 6. OK, <laughs> good, good. <laughs> All right, so should we run it from the top now since we're going to go to a move seven variation? Yep, so we can play through the moves again, and I th think we're going to split at the a6 move again. Is that right? Uh, yes, after move six. Yep. So here's our six a6 rare move, and now we'll look at bishop to g5, second most popular reply for white. Yep, so we looked at c takes before and now we'll look at bishop coming out and hitting the knight all right so um what's the idea behind bishop g5 is it just to double our pawns and look to capture on d5 that looks like the most common idea to me yeah that's exactly right so they're they're actually trying to win the pawn on d5 mm -hmm. um so here we could take c4 but what it does is it gives white a very easy bishop takes c4 so similar to like a queen's gambit structure Oftentimes you don't want to take this pawn on c4 until it, the bishop on f1 has moved at least once so that you can make it move a second time. Um, if you take right away, it makes white's development too easy. So here I'm recommending a move similar to the other lines we looked at, bishop to e6. Uh, so now when we see the bishop on g5, there's no knight to g5 attacking our bishop. And what we want to do is encourage this c4 pawn again to make a decision. Right? We're threatening now to maybe take on c4 right away. Does it want to push? Does it want to take? Um, and we are not afraid a bishop takes f6. And we'll look at some lines like that. That's That'll give us the bishop pair. So we're not afraid a bishop takes f6 here. Yep, and so after bishop e6, I see a couple moves here. Should we try c5 first? Yeah, let's do c5, and then we'll come back to bishop takes f6. Okay, so c5 pushing past. Um, first thing that should come to your mind here is this deep pawn is now backwards, and we should look to attack it or apply some long-term pressure to that pawn. Um, so easy way to do that is to get the bishop involved. So I see we're going to go g6 with the idea of fianchettoing that bishop. Yep, that's exactly right. And white's most popular move, bishop e2. Here we fiend Keto preparing to castle. White castles, we castle. And now our plan is to play knight to e4, bishop to g4 attacking this knight. And you see the pawn on d4 is being attacked by the g7 bishop and the knight on c6. So that's a lot of arrows, but the plan is <laughs> knight e4, bishop g4, and pressure the d4 pawn. Yeah, see the line goes a little further. So uh, is this just a sample line? I assume there's not too many games in this. Yeah, no, there's not many games. Um, so I looked at what happens if white plays a3, just to show what could happen from our point of view. Mm -hmm. Knight e4. Um, so now this bishop actually has to move. And the d4 pawn is starting to become pretty weak. So after bishop to h4, there's this uh, really strong move, f5. And at this point, we have a large advantage because what's going to happen is the f3 knight cannot move, right? So you see how the d pawn has two defenders and we have two attackers on it? Mm -hmm. The f3 knight cannot move. This bishop does not have a lot of squares. What we can do is play for h6, g5, f4, just trying to trap the bishop. And it's very, very slow, like caveman trapping of a piece. Yeah, and even if white goes bishop g3 and h3, well, at that point, we take the bishop yeah, that's right, and make them take back with the f pawn. Um, and yeah, we already have a pretty nice position here. And if the bishop goes back to e3, we can do a similar line with f5 threatening f4 right away. Um, nice big space advantage. And another thing to notice or to note too is I can't really take this knight because we take back with the pawn, and now we're forcing this uh, this knight away, and we're going to win the d4 pawn and the game. 
Yeah, that's a really good point too. So white can't take the knight on e4. That's exactly right. Uh, so now let's look at the move that probably a lot of players are wondering about. Well, what happens if they take this knight? Maybe we don't want to see the double pawns. Um, but as we're going to see in the Tartikauer chapter, we actually recommend a line where we allow it a knight capturing on f6 and we take back with the e pawn. So we'll see some similar themes here that we see in that chapter, which will be chapter 5. Yeah, and so one nice thing about this I have found in my games is this uh, kind of like double left pawn as any king side pawn play is really yours to play for because you have an extra defender and you have an extra pawn just to kind of shove down the board. Um, but anyway, it, we can get into that next chapter. We're going to see more of this type of thing. So here, uh, white, of course, continues to take the pawn. And we're going to take back with the bishop. And again, we found ourselves in an isolated queen's pawn position. Um, so very similar type of plans here. Yeah, we're looking at um, bishop takes f3 right away, uh, pressuring yep. this pawn on d4. Yeah, for sure. And um, I just turned the engine on just to kind of see where we're at. And it says, well, it's kind of bouncing back between equal, slightly better, slightly worse. But it's kind of settling on a little better already. So happy opening. Um, <laughs> line <laughs> continues a little further. Yeah, so most popular move, bishop e2. Um, it looks like we would naturally want to put this bishop out through the queen side, right? Like maybe bishop b4, bishop e7. But what we want to do here is actually pressure the d4 pawn with the fianchetto bishop. So g6, planning bishop to g7. Uh, you can also sometimes play the bishop out to h6, uh, but usually it's going to go to g7. So after castle, bishop g7. I think we already have a slight advantage here just because of this long-term pressure on the d pawn. And what we can do is after we castle, queen d8, put a rook on d8, and just slowly build up the pressure on d4. And like Jesse said, the extra f pawn is actually advantageous. Like you can see right now, we're guarding these squares that the f3 knight looks at, but this pawn could also push forward in the future, unleashing the power of this bishop and helping control these squares while our king is still safe with the other f pawn waiting back there. Yep, and you can see with this isolated d pawn is there's a lot of holes in white's camp. So uh, these c4 and e4 squares, of course, uh, if white ever plays f3 to kind of get a handle on this square a little better, that's really weakening, especially with our dark square bishop and just their dark squares in general. So I think um, it's kind of it's kind of good for us if they want to trade down because then we can play against the isolated queen pawn. But if they want to keep pieces on, I feel like our minor pieces are going to have more scope here in the long run too. Yeah, I was just going to make that exact same point. So we have the bishop pair now, and if they take on d5, and then we get the extra uh, piece traded off in our IQP endgame. So it's kind of a win-win for us. We have different imbalances that we can play with uh, to our advantage. So let's go yeah, so back. Double that I was going to say, double f pawns, nothing to be afraid of here. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely true. Uh, so let's go back to move 7 and look at c5 for white. Yep, right here. So c5. And I, I think this was the first move I looked at. So when I looked at this a6 line, the first move I thought, well, I don't know what to do in these positions with c5. Because I thought, well, maybe a6 doesn't seem as useful here once c5 is played. You know, the center's not opening up. There might not be bishop to b5 check. Uh, but I think I found some consistent lines with the other variations of this chapter. Uh, so we're eventually going to play for g6, bishop g7. But first what I wanted to do was solve the problem of the light square bishop, potential problem of the light square bishop, and put him out to g4 right away. So bishop g4, and do you see our immediate threat here already, Jesse, to, to kind of mess up white's position? Yep, so if we capture the knight right away, um, white, if you know white wants to hold their pawns together, they drop the d4 pawn. So they're going to have to take back with the f, or sorry, the g soon to be f pawn if they want to hold their back their backwards d pawn. So already not just like an empty uh, threat here. It's like there's some something that white needs to address. Yeah, and you'll find some players when they see us attacking this quickly, will start to play passive, like bishop e3 bishop e2, and before you know it, we have all the play in the position, we have the initiative, and white's just been sitting back making passive moves. Uh, so that's something that white has to be very careful with in these lines, and almost no one has seen a6. So like like Jesse <laughs> mentioned earlier, uh, the, the opponent might be a little bit confused. The game is definitely in our court. 
So at this point, let's continue the inkedo. Um, if if white plays h3 in this position instead of castling, we do have to be a little bit careful because this bishop cannot go back due to g4. Um, so after h3, what we want to play is bishop takes f3, and then we play against the pawn on d4. So something to keep in mind. If h3, we take, and then play against the pawn on d4. Yeah, it makes sense. And there's not really another good square for the bishop anyway, so it's a pretty weak piece, even though it's technically outside of our pawn chain. So snapping the knight off here is not uncommon or unusual, I would say. Yeah, and just to kind of show the setup, it would be bishop here, probably e6 to guard the d-pawn, castle, and b6. So that's going to be the way that we uh, apply the pressure to d4. Yeah, the knight is nicely positioned here to avoid b4 and kind of clamping down this pawn chain that they could have, so we can, because I can just take it. Yeah, definitely slows them down, that's right. So back to the main move, castle. Bishop g7, h3, and then continue with that consistent plan. Bishop takes f3, and there's just nowhere better for that bishop to go, so I think it's pretty easy to solve that over the board. And also, if you just kind of think about the long-term plans that we talked about, how do we attack d4? Simplest way is to remove the knight on f3. Yep, good point. Um, so in this position, after e6, this is the end of our line, we have this really cool maneuver, knight maneuver. Um, it involves the f6 knight. So how can the f6 knight apply pressure to d4? What do you think, Jesse? Mm -hmm. I was thinking backwards knight move and kind of swing it around this way. That's exactly right. And that puts All a right. third attacker on d4. And, uh, you know, a lot of times what can happen to white's position here is they'll play bishop e3, knight d2. And again, all the pieces are very passive, just waiting, and our pieces are all attacking. That's when we go b6, bring the queen out, open the rooks up. Um, we have a pretty nice initiative already. Yep, so very common plans here is just attack the weak pawn. So here the d-pawn is backwards, and other lines the d-pawn has been isolated. So just knowing kind of how to handle that type of imbalance and how to play against it will take you a long way. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, so let's go back to move 6a6 where we have all the arrows. And now we'll look at the fourth and final option, kind of the quiet option. Uh, bishop e2. And the reason you won't see this as often as the other three moves we looked at is because when white decides to play the Panov attack, they tend to be an aggressive player. So playing a move like bishop e2 in an aggressive opening, just it just doesn't feel natural. So don't expect to see this as often, um, but I think it's still worthwhile to look at because in the other lines, white's making moves that are more committal, whereas bishop e2 is a pretty flexible move. Yeah, and it also seems a bit uh, anti-thematic too, because as we mentioned earlier, we don't want to take this pawn until the bishop moves. And now that the bishop moves, it's kind of like they're wasting a move that they want to take back with the bishop. Um, but but that's not we're gonna what we're gonna go for. So we kind of like to keep this the pawn structure similar. So again, we're gonna go g6 and fianchetto and play against uh, this weak d pawn. Yeah. So, and, and part yeah. of the reason for that is if we do have this trade with d5 and c4. It lines their bishop up with our pawn on f7, and sometimes that can lead to uh, quick kingside attacks for white. So yeah, I think this is consistent, but also it's a safe option, g6. Yeah, another, I was going to say, another thing with the bishop here is it supports this uh, early pawn push, and then they can just really push it into our core, and it gets very, and we feel very squeezed very quickly. Yeah, that's another really good point. That's exactly <laughs> right. Don't take the pawn. <laughs> yeah. So castle... Uh, bishop g7, and now you can see we're going to go for this quick pressure again, whether it's a backward pawn on d4 or an isolated pawn. Um, the most popular move is bishop g5, and now this is where, again, white's threatening. Bishop takes f6, followed by winning the pawn on d5. So don't castle on autopilot here. Um, the move we're recommending is similar to the other variations, bishop to e6. And the plan now is going to be castle, and at that point we're going to either take on d4, or play knight to e4, depending on white, what white does. Yep, so similar setup here when we play knight e4 before. Um, without the bishop on e6, it doesn't quite work to play it immediately because then they can just take the pawn. 
So we want to support that pawn with uh, bishop b6. And now, uh, yes, yeah, bishop b6. And now bishop b4 is kind of on the table again. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that covers all of our variations after six knight f3. So I think we should maybe run it all the way back to the beginning one more time. And the next yep. line we'll look at is six bishop to g5. So this is the panel of attack after c4. Knight c6, um, bishop to g5. All right, so again with the same threats as they can take here, we take back and now they're winning the d-pawn. So we need to address it again. And uh, you guessed it, bishop e6. <laughs> <laughs> so keeping in line with our other uh, ideas is we're going to defend the, the pawn with the light score bishop. Yeah, and here we look at two moves, c5 and knight f3. Um, I did have a note in the text that if white plays a slow move, we actually have queen to b6 ideas here as well, eyeing the b2 pawn and the d4 pawn. So a nice little tactic to keep in mind. But I think most players you'll see are probably going c5 or knight f3 here. So let's start with c5. So now we see the pawn is backward on d4. And consistent with the other chapter, or the other variations, I should say, we're going for the kingside fiend kettle. One nice thing with this variation, we never played a6, but at the same time, we actually didn't really need it. Um, because this pawn committed so early to c5, we never needed to play a6. So something to keep in mind, don't always need to play a6 if white goes for this very quick bishop g5 variation. Yep, and similar plan is when we're playing against the backward d pawn and other lines, is we're going to fianchetto the dark score bishop and just eye up this pawn. Again, maybe knight e4 is on the table someday. And so we can kind of follow through the line. I think knight f3 is going to be the most common move here. And uh, fianchetto the bishop, following through with our plan. And bishop b5 attacking the knight. So this is kind of a newish move because in our other lines we have played a6. Right, and I, I threw this one in here because I think it's it's one the most popular, but also it's a way that white can try to put some pressure on us in an aggressive opening. Uh, but here we don't really miss uh, not having played a6. We can just castle out of the pin. And after white castles, now that this bishop on e6 has done his job, provoking the c-pawn to do something. We can play bishop g4, and you can see we're shifting gears. We're going to go target the d4-pawn now, right? So we're threatening. Bishop takes f3 tactics, and then the immediate knight takes d4. Yep, so one way white can continue to play is uh, capturing the knight. We, take, of course, take back with the g-pawn. And now they put us to the test again with h3. So I think it's very thematic here to capture the knight that's defending this backward pawn. So we attack, and uh, queen takes, again, preserving their pawn structure. And here we're going to play knight d7. So what's the idea behind the knight retreat? It'll take a couple moves to maneuver, but what we want to do is we want to play for e5. Um, and I know you've, you've been a London player yourself, Jesse. Sometimes in the London you can get these structures too where maybe black advances their pawns and white's going for an e4 break. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's sort of similar to that. Once we get e5 in, not only are we targeting d4, but we're targeting the pawn on c5. Uh, but it's going to take a couple moves. So what we'll probably need to play is rook e8 next, and then try to get our queen out, and then play e5. But there are ways that white can slow us down, like rook e1, rook e8. Um, we have to be a bit careful. I mean, we can't immediately play e5 or queen c7. So sometimes you might play h6 first, get the bishop away, but that's the long-term plan. Play for e5. And and I should mention white also has to guard this d4 pawn right away. So there's no yeah, rookie one immediately. <laughs> yep, so that's a good pawn break to know. So weakening their little uh, pawn structure, or, uh, pawn chain is a term I'm looking for, interrupting their pawn chain here and kind of just weakening the position, opening it up and looking for some dynamic play. Yeah, I like the uh, end game as well because there's even moves like rook b8 pressuring down the b file. So we yeah, get, good point. get a lot of play here. So instead of 7c5 now, let's look at a developing move, developing a minor piece, knight f3. Um, we're going to go with g6. So 
get the bishop to g7, we see it in every line, hit the pawn on d4. Uh, if white plays c5 here, that'll transpose to the line we just looked at. So now let's go back and look at another bishop takes f6 line. So we've looked at one of these before, but now we don't have a6 played. Yep, so this one is a little... I don't know, it's pretty similar because we can take back with the e pawn. We have these double f pawns. Um, this doesn't change our plan with the bishop. We're still going to bring it to g set, uh, g7, and we can apply pressure someday when we push this f pawn forward. And again, we can just kind of charge forward with our kingside pawns as a long-term plan. So here, white is going to advance with c5, and again, we're playing against this backwards d pawn. So we'll fianchetto the bishop. And, um, you know, there's a few ways that white can continue here. Um, the sample line, I guess, we're going to follow through here. Follow through here with this bishop b5, similar to the last line. Yeah, and, and that's the most popular move again. And the reason you'll see bishop b5 most often is because if white can take on c6, it relieves some of the pressure on the pawn on d4. So bishop b5 is a very common move when they're allowed to play it, when we're not playing a6. Yep. <laughs> um, so after castle, the next thing we want to do is play bishop g4. And you can see this pressure is coming really quick on the pawn on d4. So if white castles, bishop g4, immediate threat of uh, bishop takes f3. So now again, white's looking to relieve pressure. Bishop takes c6, b takes c6, h3. We see this exact same theme again, take on f3, queen takes f3. And now here I'm recommending f5. So if you look at the bishop on g7, that bishop is on dark squares, and it's now pointed at the, the weakest pawn for white. And then look at our pawns. All of these pawns are on light squares. The only pawn that's on a dark square is a7. So the pawns complement the bishop. This is a very strong long-term position because now white has to babysit this pawn on d4 the rest of the game, and all of our pieces are very solid. So the, the plan with the remaining three pieces is queen a5, rook b8, rook e8, and we're going to look for ways to just keep increasing that pressure and, and make white play defensive. Yeah, definitely. So white's biggest weakness here is d4, and it's, it's already under attack, and we're going to be able to attack it further with maybe some kind of rook lift here or here someday. And our weakest pawn is on c6, and how realistically is white going to get at that pawn? It's just so well defended and kind of like deeper into our position, so it's a lot easier for us to attack us to attack white's weaknesses for them to do it put any kind of pressure on our weak c pawn yeah and even though even though the position's a bit closed in the center which can favor a knight uh, there's no easy outpost for that knight to get to from c3 uh, so it's another nice thing with this position is our bishop hits d4 and the knight doesn't have any like strong squares to counter that it's not like the knight can hop to e5 for example and play f4 and create an outpost and even if he got to e5 we always have f6 in reserve so yep. <laughs> really nice minor piece imbalance here, the bishop versus knight. All right, so now the next line we should look at is five knight f3. So I'm going to run this back to the start. Um, and the reason I want to run this back to the start is because in this line, take, take, white can play knight f3 here. And if white plays knight f3 here before playing c4, it can transpose into some different things. So that's why we're looking at uh, knight f3 on move 5 as well, because the move order can be a little bit funny. Um, but the nice thing about us not going for this early g6 is we can be consistent with how we set up our pieces. So if we go knight c6, we have this exact same setup if this knight was on c3 and this knight was back. So if white goes knight c3 here, we just know it transposes. So the only other uh, kind of dangerous system that white can play here is to take on d5 and delay knight c3. So not transposing back with a very early bishop to c4. Um, this was a line that kind of gave me a bit of hesitation because like Jesse was saying earlier, when that bishop comes to c4 so quickly, we do have to watch for pawn to d5. So being consistent with some other uh, variations of this chapter, what do you think the move here is, Jesse? 
Um, well, I assume we just want to reinforce the knight, so bishop b e6, and uh, further blockade the d-pawn if there's exchanges. Yeah, and, and we have a cool threat here of knight to e3, and the most popular move in this position, so I'm looking at the kind of club level database, castling has played 78 times here, and knight g5 has played 9 times is number 2, so almost everyone castles. And after castling, now we can play knight to e3, and this is going to gain us the bishop pair. So after f takes e, so sorry, I probably went a little bit faster, but we're on the queen and we're on the rook. So white has to take on e3, essentially. Yeah, and we're on the bishop, too. And then we're on the bishops, and then we get the bishop pair. This bishop, or the rook moves off of f1, e6. Now, if you look at the imbalances here, we have the bishop pair, but white does have a pretty strong center with the e and d pawns. Um, so the plan is going to be bishop e7, castle. If this bishop gets kicked, he'll come to a6. And then we go queen c7, bring the rooks to the middle, and play for e5. So, and you don't have to have all those moves memorized, but the idea is you develop all the pieces first. And then we're going to play for a way to chip open the center with e5. And that's going to be strong because we have the bishop pair. And if we can start trading those pawns in the middle, um, the bishops really come to life. And, and the white king is a bit open as well. Yep, so the white king is a bit open. We have the bishop pair. So anytime you have the bishop pair, you really should be looking to open the position and use the scope of these uh, uh, long distance pieces, I should say. So very, uh, very thematic type of plan there. And it's also nice that we're kind of keeping our bishop in our own court so they can't be harassed by knight moves or pawn moves and we're not wasting time uh, kind of shuffling our bishops around. Yeah, so keeping the bishop safe while we get developed and then he'll come out later uh, when the time is right. All right, we only have one chapter left, Jesse. It's the little brother of the Panov <laughs> attack, <laughs> accelerated Panov attack, uh, 2c4. And this variation, uh, let's look at the numbers. So what are you seeing in the Grandmaster database here? How often is c4 played? So it looks like c... Okay, so in this here we have about 75,000 games, and c4 is played 4,000 times. So what's that like, 5%, something like that? Yeah, and I think... Uh... I did the math on the club level games and it was like 2%. So it's okay. even more rare. Um, but the issue is, or sorry, the C4, the potential issue is we're looking at a line that's very rarely played, but it's also very sharp. Um, and your opponent's going to know a lot of these lines because every time they see the Carol, they're probably playing the accelerated Panov attack. Mm -hmm. So how can we use 2% of our repertoire to cover an opening that white might be very prepared for. The answer is we're going to look for a rare line, again, that we put the game in our court. So we're going to look for a line that surprises our opponent so that we can get out of their preparation. Uh, so first we're playing the most common move, d5. After takes, takes, takes. Uh, the move I'm recommending here, Jesse, is a6, which is the third most common move at the club level, it's only 2,000 games out of almost 200,000 games. <laughs> and I have, it's a similar ratio for the Grandmaster games. A6 has 32 versus about 4,000. So yeah. one, one in, what is that, one in a hundred, one in a thousand, something like that? Yeah, I can't do math. It, it's a weekend, Jesse. <laughs> it's, it's a weekend. It's a rare, yeah. <laughs> I was told there'd be no math. <laughs> yeah, I told there'd be no math. So A6, uh, again, Covering b5, and if queen a4, we have pawn b5. So we're taking away the most aggressive moves for white. The other thing I like about a6 is we can actually still win this d5 pawn back pretty much by force um, using this like pawn to b5 kick if there's a bishop on c4, followed by bishop to b7. So what I logged here was the most popular line for white. Knight to c3, knight f6. Bishop c4. Now, what would you play here, Jesse? Um, I think b5 and just Fianchetto the bishop to put pressure on the deep pawn. Yeah, that's exactly right. So b5, they retreat. Bishop b7. So now if you counter attackers, one, two, three, 
Uh, there's only two defenders for white. Knight f3 is the move I'm showing. But what do you think about queen to f3, Jesse? Trying to defend queen. that pawn a third time. Queen to f3, I was just thinking we could undermine with e6 because that pawn is pinned. Yeah, exactly right. So we're following the most common moves for white. They're probably not the most precise if you put this into stockfish analysis or if you look at the grandmaster games but white just played very natural moves i'm going to back up a couple moves they guarded or defended once with knight c3 defended twice with bishop c4 now all of a sudden they realize oh wait i can't defend it a third time with queen f3 now they need to just give the pawn back um, so this could play out with knight takes d5 castle and here I put that e6 was probably the easiest path to safety. So if you look at our king, we still have to get castled. It might be nice to fee and kettle, similar to other lines, hit a pawn on d4 later on. But we need to get the king castled pretty quickly here. Um, e6 is the safest. So d4, bishop e7, rook e1, castle. All right, so here we have an isolated queen pawn structure. Um, what we're going to look at next is how you can transition this from an IQP to hanging pawn. So what's the move to do that here? Yeah, so here if we take the knight on c3, they're going to take back with the pawn. Whoops, can't draw arrows. Oh, my mouse is freaking out. Here, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. There we go. Nope, still missed it. <laughs> take, take, and now they have hanging pawns. It's those bugs. <laughs> those yeah, those leeches bugs. bugs. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, we can take here, b takes back, uh, knight d7. So again, uh, hanging pawns, trades are good for us on average. So unless there's some like really strong attack for white after the trade, these trades should help us. We're going to put a rook on c8, probably want the other rook on d8. The queen's going to be in front of the pawns, and we can start to attack these guys on d4 and c3. Also note that the hanging pawns are not next to each other. So again... When you see the hanging pawns not next to each other, there's the weaknesses in front of the pawns. So I'm getting fancy here with the blue circles, but it just shows <laughs> the blue circles block the green circles, and those pawns on the green circle squares are weak. Yeah, and I think this can highlight, too, why we didn't recommend uh, fianchettoing the bishop. So if you imagine the bishop is on g7, now it's just staring at this pawn wall. So if we yeah, right, go back right. in time to why we didn't recommend the g6s, uh, g6 bishop g7 as we are planning to take them into this hanging pawn structure and here you don't want your bishop staring down that pawn chain yes that's exactly right so i think uh, out of the whole carol concourse in my opinion the panov attack is probably the most aggressive and by looking at these lines it doesn't really feel like we're getting into any danger here right it feels like we're just developing naturally we're playing this offbeat move a6 in a lot of lines, and we're playing this uh, sort of strange looking, but it's not too offbeat, bishop e6 move in a lot of lines. These are both things that will most likely surprise your opponent. You'll feel more comfortable than your opponent, hopefully, and also there will be these sort of uh, traps along the way, as well as just these long-term positional plans against the d4 pawn. And I think that the main thing in this chapter to think about is how to attack the pawn on d4. Like almost every single line, the, the plan is to attack the pawn on d4, whether it's hanging pawns, isolate a pawn on d4, or a backward pawn on d4. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully we gave you some consistent ideas for how to at least approach the position, even if you're not memorizing all the moves. And um, as always, we'll leave you at the end of each line with a plan and um, just good ideas for how to proceed with the game after you can find yourself out of the opening. Yep, that's exactly right.